I will not, this is not a, this, I'm going to tell you something my mentor told me, and then I'm going to tell you that I am not the same way. My mentor used to say, you, you guys remember Admiral Akbar from the Star Wars? You remember his famous line? It's a trap! Right? Yes? Everybody? You guys? Those of you who haven't seen Star Wars, it's this uh, squid-like figure with really big eyeballs. He's, he's not a fish. He's like, he looks like, a, he looks like an octopus. Yeah. OK, now we're getting into an argument about Admiral Akbar. We're on a great terms. OK, the point is, is that every time my mentor would ask me a question, it was always a trap. And so he was expecting me to think of it like that. Oh, thank you. OK. I'm glad we got to the bottom of that. All right, so moving forward, this, this question is not a trap. I just want you to present how you understand the assurance of salvation as it is presented in the scriptures and it is as it is presented in theology. Be now, that's a really big ask because there have been a lot of like papers and scholarly documents and arguments through the church through the centuries, the millennia, about what assurance of salvation means. But to the best of your understanding, what do you think of when you think of assurance of salvation? Colby. Uh, I just think of once you gain salvation, you mm. can never lose it. And okay. That's, in what that, of that's okay. Did you want to add to that? I was going to say once it always say the same thing you said. Okay. Can I have a more drawn out, less, I don't mean to, in this in the accusatory way, but less bumper sticker manner? Someone want to flesh that out for me? Mm -hmm. can or can you not lose said there you go. Okay. I saw one more hand over here, and I don't remember who it was. Someone was, Lexi. Yes. So I think of it as that. Yeah. You're good. Once you have received the Holy Spirit, I do not believe you lose it. Hmm. Mm, interesting. Yes, Maddie Kate. That raises the question of what if you don't confess your sins before you die? Hmm, that does raise a question. Okay, Sean. So now we're introducing predestination. predestination versus free will into the conversation, which is a whole nother ball of wax that we're going to only be able to like scrape the top off of, unfortunately. Um, remind me your question one more time. The question. And why did David ask to be forgive for all, forgiven for all the sins that he didn't know he committed in the Psalms, which is a whole nother adventure. Um, yes, that's a great point, Sam. So we've got a whole, uh, yes, plethora of things to get to. And I'm trying to figure out that, like, there you go. Five second, ten second rule, whatever we call that. Um, yeah, no, it, it's good. There's no germs on the floor. The floor has been cleaned. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thrown under the bus. 
So wait, that's a great transition. Confession required before you die. So does God hold that rule rigorously? Or does your confession work past your next uh, falling down moment where you fall short of who he is, right? Does your confession cover over all the sins of your future, or does it just cover the sins of your past? Um, when your salvation is secured, supposedly, what, what does that, yeah, what does that mean? Because once saved, always saved, means that someone who has said, Jesus, I want you to come into my life and change me from the inside out at some sort of emotional something or other, or junior high camp, or you, you name it. And uh, now, if you just take it at the bumper sticker value of like that, that is the absolute truth of the statement. That person, are they saved? Are they not saved? Do we know? Is that our place to know? Is that my understanding? meeting your understanding somewhere. Here's the other thing. I was talking with my wife, and she was like, an assurance of salvation, isn't that like just when you like, like, like recommit your life to Christ again? Which just goes back to like the, the prayer for forgiveness. And it makes me wonder, why, why do people recommit their lives to Christ if it's once saved, always saved? Yes, Trent. What was the verse where it said, like, even though you repent, I never really knew you? Mmm. Matthew chapter 7. Someone want to go there? Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, I want to say. We don't all have to go there, but I'd like someone to go there and, and dig into it. Oh, we got some people fast on the draw. Perfect. Ah. So how do we know who's doing the will of the Father in heaven? Okay. So... But your actions don't save you, which is the whole book of James in a nutshell, right? Yes, Colby. Um, I'm just of the opinion that you can't know if someone is saved. Mm -hmm. The only thing is you can know if they're not saved because they tell you they're not saved. Okay. I think, yeah. So that, that's possible. I get that. Um, let me take you down that rabbit hole for half a second. What would be the usefulness of knowing that they are not saved? When they tell you that they're not saved. Yes? The way in which you speak to them, for one. Okay. How, what, so what, uh, what, what approaches would that inspire in you uh, to speak to them? Well, it's kind of like the difference between an analogy. Like if you're talking to an adult, mm -hmm. you have a more in-depth conversation about some things that you'll be on equal, like equal mm -hmm. boundaries. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're talking to a child, you approach it a lot differently. You, you use language in which the child understands. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same thing, whereas if you're talking to a believer, then there are some things you can talk about on a more in-depth level, versus if you're talking to somebody who's not saved, obviously it's a very different approach. Hmm. I would contend that I've talked to a bunch of people who aren't saved but know the Christian faith really, really well, that I can talk with them about on a pretty deep level, deeper than a lot of other people that I would consider followers of the way, and they kept up with me pretty well. The demeanor, though. It's not, okay. It's not shared. Yes. Well, That's the difference in the at least partially, yeah. Okay. You had a thought. I was going to say, for example, that a lot of like, atheists were Christians first, but then turned away from it. Mm -hmm. That's how they went off. Exactly. Yes. And how you pray for them. Yes, and how you pray for them. That's very true. Um, <sighs> okay. Um... Here's what I would like to get to. Not just the importance of knowing whether someone is saved or not saved. I would like us to ask a slightly different question to get to the importance of the doctrine of assurance of salvation. Um, so this is a doctrine that is not explicitly stated anywhere by Jesus, yes? Paul talks about if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's in Acts. No, that's in Romans chapter 9. 9, verses 10 through 11, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, so here's... <laughs> forgive me for like getting into the semantics of it. I would like to take this, rather than having a, like a proof texting analysis, I would like us to go at this 
from the realm of logically, as we observe the themes, motifs through the scriptures, what does the characteristics of God through the scriptures tell us about uh, assurance of salvation as it relates to self-preservation? Do you guys understand what self-preservation is? Yes. Okay. Um, walk with me through this. When we want to know whether someone, whether we are saved or not saved, right? So part of the assurance of salvation is how can someone know if they are saved, right? So yes, we can't know if someone is not saved. How can we know that we are saved, right? That is part of the predicament of the doctrine of assurance of salvation. Yes. Are you guys following? It, have I lost everybody? Okay, okay. Not everybody. Is that, part of it is that we want to know for ourselves that we cannot lose our salvation. Yes? I want to contend a few things. The why behind that gets really dark and a little bit hazy when you talk about it in relation to the themes of scripture rather than just pulling a verse or two out. What is the background behind Romans chapter nine when we talk about the confess with your mouths, mouths and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's go dig in to Romans chapter nine. Is it nine or ten? I believe, oh, I it's ten. it might be 10, but the whole theme starts in nine. 10, nine and 10. Ten, yeah, that's what it is. It's 10, nine and 10, but nine is where the idea starts. That's why I'm going there. Okay. Yep, I'm going to go to 9. Hang on, let me go to 10 just to make sure. Oh, yeah, if you jump in at 10, you're already halfway through his argument that he started. Okay, okay. We're going to start at 9. Don't get lost. Um, how many of you guys have read all of Romans before? How many of you guys have, like, done studies on the themes through Romans before? Okay. How many of you guys have, like... Uh, gone and consulted theologians who study Paul rigorously. Like, been like, okay, not like consulting face-to-face, -face, but like, I want to know why they say these things through here. Lily, you remember when you were like reading Psalm, what was it, 11 or something like that? And you were like, what the heck is going on here? And we were like, wait, let's slow that down and think about it. But realistically, if, if I wasn't there to say, hey, wait, we got to waha -oh our way through that, the next step would be, Let's go find someone who's an expert on Psalms and figure out why they can reason through that and not be like, this is messed up, bro. Right? Okay. Same thing's true here. You can read Romans and come out of it with a whole bunch of conclusions. But Paul wrote Romans for a reason. There are a whole bunch of theologians that have tried to express that, and all of them have a whole bunch of different theories. My first guess as I read through Romans is to go to the guy that is like, worldwide recognized as like the head like theologian of Romans, which I wrote his name up on the board in that slash N.T. Wright. Have you guys heard of N.T. Wright? Anybody? Bueller? Yes? Okay. N.T. Wright um, is one of, if not the like most prominent, well-respected figures when it comes to discussing anything about Paul. Paul wrote Romans. If you want to learn about something that you are confused about in Romans, you can talk to your pastor. That's a great starting point. You can talk to a teacher that you know. That's also a great starting point. You can also like go find an N.T. Wright book about Paul and Romans and be like, what does this guy say about it? Because all of the pastors that you guys are going to have probably done the exact same thing. Like That's a great starting point. Um, him and this guy named Scott McKnight have written extensively on Romans. Scott McKnight wrote this book that N.T. Wright recommended called Reading Romans Backwards. Have you ever tried reading Romans backwards? Not word for word backward, but chapter for chapter backward. It's very interesting. Changes how you look at the book of Romans, because it's a letter where all the chapters are intertwined. It's one, big it's one big argument, but it's actually divided into like three-ish sections, because he like stops his whole argument at the end of seven and starts over at eight, and then he stops at the end of eight and starts at nine and goes on. And then I guess technically he stops at 15, well, 13 and then... 13 through 16, but so it's four. Um, so this is the start of a new argument because eight is the end of the, the eight is one all to itself. Okay. 
I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to all the flesh who is over all. God be blessed forever. Amen. That is the longest. No, it's not. It's a regular sized Paul sentence. Let's be real. It's a really long sentence. It goes a lot Paul loves run on sentences. You guys know that from reading Ephesians this last week? Yes? yes? Okay, good. Does anybody want to summarize that sentence for me? Oh, interesting. Okay. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are all Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Every following? No? no? no. Perfect. Okay, no. someone explain it. Well, how way your, your way through it? Not super slowly, but slow enough that you can explain it to Kate. What just happened there? Oh, just because your name is an Israelite doesn't mean you're saved. Doesn't mean that you're chosen. Doesn't mean that you're chosen. Right. So you can choose to follow God even though you're not the one related to Israel. All right, we're going to relate this back to the rest of Romans really quick. Romans 1 through 3, Paul spends a whole bunch of words, and you can read through this for yourself, spends three chapters writing, just introducing himself to his audience, which is a collection of Jews and non-Jews that all go to the same church. And they are seemingly not always on the same page about everything. And he's got to find a way to get them all to agree that they are all under Christ together. And that they should listen to him, this nobody from Jerusalem. Nobody in quotes. Um, he does it masterfully. It's amazing. Um, but it's really complicated and difficult to work through. He's gotten them to this point. Here in 9, by weaseling his way through a whole bunch of really, really complex arguments. And now he's trying to say, not everybody that's Israel is Israel. He's been saying that since chapter 1. When he said, hey, guess what? You, you Gentiles who have like, gone off and chased after all these things, you're in sin. Hey, you Jews that are judging them for doing all those things, you're also in sin. Oh, we're all stuck in sin. Oh, crap. How do we get out of this? And spends the whole like, first section of Romans talking through that. Now he's like, listen, I have reasons for this. I have reasons. There's, there's method behind the madness. What we're trying to get to here, let's keep going. Oh my gosh, there's so much that I want to talk about and not nearly enough time. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. <sighs> okay, where did I end off at? Eight, yeah. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who regard as descendants. So you don't have to be from Abraham to be part of God's family. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also. When she had conceived in twins by one man, our father Isaac, for it, the twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of the works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, which is actually really funny because in the Hebrew back in Genesis, it says it's actually a riddle, which says the older will the younger serve. It's like Yoda, which makes it really confusing because nobody knows what that means. There's a big section of a book, a commentary by Jonathan Sachs on that. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, if you want to look up that confusing quandary. Just as it's written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, which is actually from Malachi, I think. Um, thank you. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. So wait, God's not unjust. Now, uh, Calvinists and Armenian theologians or predestination and uh, free will theologians, for those of you that don't always relate it back to that, they both have ways of working through this section. 
They go in different directions and take different routes of getting there. But the point is, God's not unjust. God has a way to do this where he can get through to everybody. Or at least as far as we understand it. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, that, and that my name might be proclaimed through the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens those he desires. He will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? That's a very, very bumper sticker answer, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> the thing that molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it, or does it not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his... Have I lost you all? Are you guys like, what is happening here? Yes? Hayden's nodding in agreement. Anybody else like, what the heck? Yes? Thanks for being honest. I appreciate that. It's not a test. It's not a trap. Okay. Long story short, Paul's like, God has reasons and ways. His summary is, his ways are deep and really unknowable, which actually goes back to Romans well, goes forward to Romans 11, where he's like, oh, the unfathomable riches and ways of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his paths, beyond finding out. Who can know them? But thanks be to God. It gets really, really deep and dark down in this rabbit hole. And this is where he finds the, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Wait, so, is it the calling on the name of the Lord that saves you, or is it God's picking you that saves you, or what's the... And this is where we come to the sticky point of assurance of salvation. What is salvation, and why do we need it? Why do we want it? Yes? I had a conversation with my violin teacher once. He, was, he just brought up, hey, I think you're religious. I'm like, great. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yep, yep. Hmm. And I was like, well, I guess that makes a lot of sense because you don't have, if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you, then it will not do anything. Hmm. I have a question. So does, how do we know who has the Holy Spirit and who doesn't have the Holy Spirit? We can't, but that person can. Colby. Um, I don't know how to answer your question. Okay. But I would disagree. Oh, with kindly, that. of course. Yeah, kindly, that Christianity doesn't do anything for you if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Right. Because I still think if you follow principles of the Bible in your life, mm. that it can help you. I mean, I to what end? I agree with you a little bit, but he wasn't talking about that. Yeah, yeah. He was looking for. Yeah, yeah. And, and therein lies the, the danger of like telling just enough of it. <sighs> I get where you're saying. I get what you're saying. I think there's probably a disconnect yeah, yeah, yeah. from where you were trying to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trisha. I'd be curious to know what his definition of do something about it is. Yes. Was he looking for... We did not go to much conjugate. Okay, the violin lesson. Yes. Fair. <laughs> Fair. And therein gets back to your violin teacher asked a very important question, which tells a very important truth about our faith. Is our faith faith meant to do something for us? Is that the goal of salvation in Christianity? What is the goal? Nick's like, where are you taking us? What are you doing? I just look at this look on your face and I'm like, I don't know. This whole chapter is all it, it's very com complex and confusing, but it deals with this exact thing. It's talk, and the only way to, the only way out is through, unfortunately. Right? You can ponder it outside of that, like, but to understand what Paul was trying to get at, you got to go through it, which is difficult. Paul's got some really difficult teachings. And this is all immediately after where he says, 
Do you guys remember 838 and 39? Do you know what that is? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, right? Angels or demons, powers or authorities, heaven or earth, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, why are you talking about, I wish I could be separated from my brothers so that they could get into the kingdom? Why are you talking about how it doesn't depend on, God's, on man's desire or effort but on God's mercy? It creates a whole bunch of puzzles in your head when you get to this section after being in that section. Yes, Blake. You were going through Job. Yes. Weeks ago. Yes, you were. John. John. Yes. And he said that the question that Job asked, the central question is, does Job fear God for nothing? Mm-hmm. And that and that's what the Satan mm-hmm. asked God. Right. Does Job fear God for nothing? And that kind of implies that we're supposed to fear God for nothing. Mm-hmm. So there really isn't a goal in Christianity other than to love God. Right? Mm-hmm. So salvation is not the goal. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I think you're getting to the heart of, and I think John got to the heart of, what we're trying to get to with assurance of salvation. Let me, we're going to just leave off of Romans so you guys can wrestle through it, but I, here's what I would like for you guys to do. If you are wrestling through Romans 9 because you're like, ends, you took it, John, you took us there, and it's really puzzling, and I don't get it, don't just like wrestle through it on your own own. Text me. Be like, okay, I'm wrestling through it. Here I am. What's going on? Why the heck is he saying this? Let's talk through it. I don't want to just leave you there like floundering around in a, a mess of theology that I put you in. That's not fair to you. Isn't that interesting? It's because it's really uncomfortable going in 9 through 11 and, and trying to give some sort of succinct answer when Paul is clearly on a completely different level from almost every theologian that we've got in the past 400 years. Like, there are not many people that keep up with Paul. It's just not how we go. Um, I can't do it. I'm not going to claim to. But I'll try. Um, Let's go back to this theme idea and talk about what was man's first downfall? What happened? We attempted and we ate fruit. Why did we eat the fruit? What was the temptation? We wanted to be gods. Why did we want to be gods? We thought we were missing out on what? Things that gods could do. Okay. Hmm. So we wanted something that we didn't had, have, have, English, language, dang it. Yes? Okay. We wanted something, why did we want something we didn't have? Yeah, it was presented in a way that it was alluring, it was interesting to the eye, it was something that was perceived as good in our own eye, and then we just went and we took it, right? And then the rest of scripture is example after example of God doing things in humans to fix the world and humans doing things to break the world again. Yes? That, that, that is the cycle of the, of the wisdom through, like, it's the constant cycle of the Israelites through the course of the Old Testament, right? It's Genesis through De- Deuteronomy is like, the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is like, hey, like, if you do these things, you're going to live. But if you don't do these things, curses upon curses upon curses. Do you know why? Because you're just taking the fruit for yourself all over again. And then they go and they walk into the promised land, and then everybody kind of does what is right in their own eyes. And then they fall flat on their faces because they bring curse upon curse upon curse upon themselves. Yes? You guys following? And then they go into exile because of all these curses that they brought on themselves, which Moses warned them about. And then they come out of exile, and God's like, hey, like, you're going to rebuild the temple, you're going to do all these things, and it's going to be great for you if you obey everything I command you, and can they do it? Not really. And then they get taken into captivity over and over and over again, right? It's this constant story going over and over again. Can you keep your eyes fixed on me, or are you going to find something that's more alluring and go after that instead? That applies to everything, not just some of the things. Here's what I would like to contend, because we only have 10 minutes left for our discussion today. N.T. Wright talked about this guy named Epicurus. How many of you guys have heard of Epicurean thought before? Anybody? Bueller? Someone want to go look it up on 
Google really quick and give me a synopsis, like a two sentence synopsis of Epicurean thought. Or you could ask ChatGPT, or I can just read it for you. Uh, Epicureanism is a system of philosophy founded around 3307 BC based upon the teachings of an ancient Greek philosopher. Uh, Epicurus. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just skip that section. Materialist following the steps of Democrates. Mm -hmm. His materialism led him to a general attack on superstition and divine intervention. Mm. Okay, that's a pretty brief synopsis. Basically, Epicurus believed that there were gods, but the gods were far away and didn't care at all. He also believed that the ultimate goal of humanity was to find the things that were enjoyable and good for us, go hang out with the people that were like us and good, and get away from all the bad stuff or remove all the bad stuff that could be around us. N.T. Wright talks about Epicurean thought and how it has invaded Western theology on a regular basis. That's like one of his pet peeves, is that people bring up Epicurean thought into their Christianity all the time because we want to have the good and get rid of the bad and run away from the bad and find ourselves in the best possible place where we get all the things that we like. Assurance of salvation, I would contend, is one of those things where it can be good, but when we make it our goal to have something assured for ourselves, we turn it into a fruit that's hanging from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it's not always that, but it can become that. If it's something you already have. Ah, but is it always something that you have? Here, let me uh, jump with me to Matthew chapter 18 really quick. Last, last scripture. This one's not nearly as like, I'm getting lost. You can just, it's, it's still going to leave you with like a, oh my gosh, what does that even mean? But Matthew chapter 18, we're going to start in verse 21. You just read this. Oh. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I don't say to you up to seven times, but 77 times. This reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed 10,000... You guys know this story, right? Okay. Someone... We just talked about... Okay, Perfect. I'm glad Dane taught on it. So, what's the end of the story? What happens? The first servant that was forgiven but did not forgive another servant was thrown into prison because he did not forgive the other servant whether what not. Okay, so, did the king re-invoke the same debt that the original, the first servant had? Yes. Does not Jesus at the end say, so my heavenly father will do to any one of you if you do not forgive your brother from his heart? Yes? So, to say that assurance of salvation is like doctrinally guaranteed, it seems like Jesus is saying, so you're going to tell God what he can and cannot do. Hmm. Hmm. Then how do you receive a seal, a promise? And here's... And here's where, uh, and so uh, let's ask Jesus that, right? That's the, yes, Nick. Can I make a response to that? Yes, go for it. So the Israelites had a sealed promise over them mm. in the entire Old Testament. Indeed they did. You see that they walk with God and then they don't. They walk with God and they don't. And a lot of times it's God is blessing them and then he's leaving them out to dry. Sometimes sending them out to the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, mm -hmm. letting them get tortured, letting their people get raped and die. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it seems like even though they have a seal, God's with them one moment and not with them the next. Mm. That is under the seal. The okay, yes, true. It's under the old covenant. But also this is Jesus talking about like the new covenant, right? He's establishing his kingdom, and this is how the new kingdom works. Is that, oh, like you don't forgive your brother from his heart? Okay, my heavenly father doesn't have to forgive you. 
Like, that's fine. So, is it that he, the seal of the Holy Spirit on your heart, like, define, like, can we, <laughs> can we put, Ah, can it? But how do we know when it's put in? We don't. Because there are so many different ways of interpreting what it means to be someone who's a, a part of the family of God. Yes? Can we all, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, go ahead, Cooper, and then Nick can go. I think it can be said, though, that it doesn't matter because God knows. God okay. knows when our name goes into the book of life. Right. Mm. And here's where we get to where you can disagree with me if you want, but I'm going to present a possible argument that navigates down the middle, where it doesn't say that assurance of salvation is like this ultimate thing that you need to know or don't need to know. Cole, I'm glad you're okay, Colby. And where it's not like there is no assurance of salvation whatsoever. N.T. Wright, in his book, Surprised by Hope, I think, um, talks about this idea of assurance of salvation as, uh, what's the exact phrasing? Give me half a second. The word is, oh my gosh, of all the times to lose my notes. Forgive me, there's like, ah. hopeful uncertainty. And here's what I mean by this. Anybody that wants to know if God can assure and guarantee your salvation, of course he can. God can do whatever the heck he wants to. Anybody that wants to try to put God's arm behind his back and say, God, no, you can't remove my salvation, there's no way you can guarantee that. That's where I'm holding to, and here's why. Because I can't argue with Jesus about that, hey, if, if my character doesn't express the fullness of the sacrifice Jesus... Is he living in me? Is he working in me? Possibly. Is he not? Maybe. What defines whether Jesus is working in me? Is whether you see fruit? Is that a fully guaranteed? Maybe. It might be. What I'm not trying to say is that there is like no assurance of salvation. What I am trying to say is that our supposed like handle that we have on it is... Uh, far more uh, l loose than we tend to think it is. Yes? Does that make sense? To be able to be like, God, I, I have you cornered. You can't do whatever the heck you want to do because I want this. That, to me, strikes me as dangerous. Whereas, if I can be like, God, I, I hope to have you. Like, what if... What if we get to what if we get to the end and it's not like what we expect it to be? What if we get to Jesus and we're like, Jesus, I just want to be with you, and he's like, Great, that's all that matters. Now we're gonna do something completely other than you thought we were gonna do. Are we okay with that? You lost me there. Does is is I feel like assurance of salvation in the grand scheme of things as a doctrine is a red herring. It's, it's a, um, when it becomes the most important thing, we have lost the plot of the scriptures. Yes? So, one of Jesus' parables, I believe, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to question whether or not you are saved or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when we're trying to decide whether or not, like, oh, let's take him as an example and look at his life, mm. it's not our job to judge whether or not someone is saved. Yes. I believe in the parable of, uh, Sowers and the seeds. Yeah, yeah. Right? And Jesus says the enemy immediately goes out in the fields and sends out different seeds. Yeah, yeah. And you can't tell the difference mm -hmm. between the seeds in there, right? So if 
could say the family of God, there are those who are saved and those who are not, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Precisely. And it's not our job to, it's the angels at the end of the age. Right. Are assigned to do that. So, I don't know uh, how helpful it is to really. And that's where I'm like, when we, when we go for like, say the sinner's prayer and you're good, that makes me cringe. When we go for, have, have, you, have you done, like, I'm not saying the sinner's prayer is bad. What I'm saying is, if you say the sinner's prayer and say, God, I repent of my sins, I want to follow you, be the king of my life, and then go continue to live our lives the exact same way we continue to live it, it for me, I did that for the first 20 years of my life. And I did it for fire insurance to be like, God, I want to make sure that I don't go to hell. What is the point? Why would we have a doctrine on assurance of salvation? Like, why is it there? That's why I wanted to get to this. What is it there for? What is it doing when we slow it down? What does assurance do for us? It assures us that we're going to get what we want. Yes? Am I wrong? Is what we want the point of the scriptures? Not really. Right? This whole, like, wrestling match between God and the people of Israel and then Jesus and the people of Israel through the course of the scriptures has been pointing us to the thing that gets us what we want is when we give up what we want to gain who knows what. To gain Jesus. That's what we're gaining. We gain Jesus and we give up everything else we have. That's what Peter said, right? Jesus, we gave everything to follow you. What will we have? And he says, you'll have a hundred times as much. A hundred times as much as what? He doesn't say. He just says a hundred times as much. Okay. And the reward is him. Not the assurance of... I think it's entirely selfish. No? No. Okay. Because God gives it as a gift. Yes. Grace. Okay. I'm not saying salvation's bad. I know. Okay, okay. But Forgive me for interrupting you. I'm sorry. In my life, I'm thankful for salvation. Mm -hmm. And I'm assured of my salvation. Mm. So to say that it's all about me when God gave me the gift, mm -hmm. I don't, don't see God taking gifts away in the Bible. Aside from the parable that we just talked about, where Jesus talks about the king reinvoking yeah, debt. He didn't forgive. That was something different. Mm. It was not the initial debt. He was forgiven for 10,000 pounds of gold. Yes. And he did not forgive someone. Yes. And he was thrown into prison. Oh, I think I read it out of the wrong one. There was one in Luke where it says the master revoked his debt and said, You don't get out until you pay the last penny. Yep, yep. Anyway. Yes. Long story short, like, it, it's, it's like you're sitting on the... It's an uncomfortable topic. Never been before this class. Sorry. <laughs> For me, it's an uncomfortable topic. Yes, Cooper. I just have a question. I, this, is a, this is a study I enjoy that I've done a lot. Yeah. I have like a four-sentence paragraph that kind of broke the assurance that they opened from my way of thinking. Yeah. Why you can try. Yeah, oh, you can. And yeah. Talk yeah, yeah. Long, we tend to seek assurance of salvation in things God is doing in our lives and our spiritual growth, mm -hmm. in good works and obedience to God's word that is evident in our life, in our Christian walk. Mm -hmm. While these things can be evident of salvation, they are not what we should base our assurance of, on of our salvation on. Mm -hmm. Rather, we should find the assurance of our salvation in the objective truth of God's word. Hmm. We should have confident trust that we are saved based on the promise God has declared, not because of our subjective experiences. Okay. And then there's a lot of verses in that's John That's basically saying that's not by works. That's the clip. Yeah. Which is not forgiving someone a work. Well, it's also saying that salvation is not a fickle thing. Salvation is not something that is whimsical and like, oh, I hope I'm saved today, and I hope I... I, hope I um, confess my sins before I die, that way I go to heaven. It's kind of like we're in control instead of God's in control. We're, instead of God's promise to us of salvation is something that we have if we trust in it. And I like how it words it, how it breaks it down that it's not whimsical, it's something that is factual. Mm. But I, 
But if it's factual, why does it require faith? Well, anything requires some faith, but faith in general, something can be factual and still require faith. I mean, our universe is a good example of that. We don't have an answer specifically how our universe was created. Mm -hmm. And you have to have faith that either to believe that God did it or believe that material did it. Right. So faith exists no matter what. It's what requires the least amount of faith really what it boils down to. Hmm. So in other words, there's no way we can 100% know exactly what happened. That's where faith steps in. Mm -hmm. But it is our job and our duty to weigh the evidence and where that evidence brings us will bring us to a place that requires the least amount of faith. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's how our legal system works. I mean, unless the judge is standing there with somebody to shoot somebody, you can't 100% say, like, hey, that person shot that person. But you can use the evidence in the room and in the crime scene to mm -hmm. say, beyond a matter of doubt, this person is the, the, the murderer. Yes. Well, I mean, science itself can't prove itself. Right. If you have faith to get to heaven, that means that you don't have facts proving we can get there. No, because we have the facts proving we can get there because God tells us this. Oh, Colby's got to... have faith in believing in God. It boils down to the bigger picture, not the finite details of we don't know. Like, it boils down to we have to believe in God and then determine that God through Scripture to understand what it means to us. Okay, we're going to pause Cooper saying, Colby has a question, and yes. Yeah, it's just on that. I believe that you can't know what happens after you die. You can't know anything because that's, that's not, like, even if someone died and then came back from the dead, they still, it's just their word. It's all, so all you can have is the most probable outcome mm. of what's going to happen. Just like you can't prove anything in the past. Well, right. You say, hey, I came from Washington, and... I have this family here, and we go back there like, this is where I grew up or whatever. I can't prove that I was there, but that's the most likely outcome. I didn't go and fake all that. Right. So I would say that we, we can't prove that we have salvation or we're going to go to heaven or even there is a heaven, but mm -hmm. that you can come to terms with that's the most likely outcome. And through faith, through faith, through faith we can understand that truth. Hmm. Right. And I think maybe we just are going to, oh, we're way up, we're, we're already past time. Sorry, I didn't mean to I, I didn't think this blow that way. Really well. one class on this. No, there's no way you can do one <laughs> class on this, but it's okay. We're going we're gonna to start this conversation and let it simmer. It'll be great. Um, as we go through the simmering process, remember that as you discuss this with your friends, they are your friends, and not your enemies. <laughs> we are all part of the same family heading towards Jesus. So, let's get... We'll, yeah, we'll resume uh, next time talking about something more enjoyable, and we'll, we will delve into the, the depths that is Revelation next time. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> way, way more enjoyable. Way more enjoyable. Um, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for putting up with this. If this was like something that just made your eyes roll back in your head, and you were like, this is the worst conversation of all time. Sorry. Um, if you want to talk about this more, uh, and argue with Cooper and myself and Colby and Nick and Lexi, then let's find a circle and sit down and have an argument circle. It'd be great. <laughs> uh, just kidding. That was a joke. Let's pray, and then let's conclude today, yeah? God, thanks for this time. Thank you that we don't have to have it all sorted out, because you do. Um, as we move forward from this, would you uh, give us the enough to take one step in the front of the other towards you, no matter what our disposition is towards this idea of assurance of salvation. Would our hope be set firmly in you? Yeah, that's what we want. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends. Did I not answer your question at all?